but some people are just full of wisdom, and uh, so, um, and in fact, the book of James even says that if you lack wisdom, you can ask God for it, and he'll give it, he'll give it liberally, and uh, this is the last week of a 15-week sermon series. Can you believe it? 15 weeks we've been in the book of James, and, uh, and there is not a more practical book that I know of uh, within God's word. Than, than the book of James. Uh, it, is, it is just one of my favorites. And uh, of course I say that every time I go through one of the Gospels. I say the Gospel of John is my favorite, Mark, Luke, whatever. And, but really, when I go through the book of James and I see what it says, it is amazing to me. Um, and if you remember, uh, last w- the last week we met... Um, the last thing I talked about was that um, is that you have a choice um, when things go wrong. You can either swear about them. Yeah, it, it was interesting to me because um, there was one of the fellows from Grateful Life, or I'm sorry, from um, from uh, City Gospel Mission, and um, and he said he said um, that when if you say a derivative of a cuss word. Uh, now I'll not go through what the derivatives are, but um, you that you have to automatically do five push-ups. Um, did I say something bad? Oh, okay, okay, good. <laughs> it's always been it's always been a fear of mine when I get up to preach, so everybody leaves. Um, <laughs> Uh, and and it, so if you say a derivative of, of a cuss word, then um, then then you uh, then you have to do five push-ups. If you say a blatant cuss word um, that might have to do a sexual reference or whatever to do with a sexual reference, um, then you have to do ten push-ups. So and it's all in their physical fitness programming or whatever it might be. And so good to have you back. And. Um, and uh, and so um, uh, I, you remember last time it was that not to swear, and uh, that was how he ended up with that parenthetical break last time. Um, let me say that. Uh, let me say that uh, it was um, this. This whole thing has been for practical living. It's been just walked out. It's, it's how we walk this whole thing out. And so this morning I want to read to you from, if you have your Bibles with you, if not, it'll, um, it won't, well, I guess it won't be up on the, on the screen because I didn't have them put it on the screen. But here it is. Um, and I had them rush out to get, it, it's hard to get old. You know that? Um, it is, you know? It is. Um, I, in fact, I was thinking as um, Ralph was reading what he was today. Um, uh, you know, in um, on Father's Day of this year, I'll have been here thirty years, or I'll have been in ministry thirty years. One of the things I look forward to between maybe retirement and and then. And then going home and being with Jesus um, is not having pastoral reviews. If you can believe that, I know that some of you think that would be a lot of fun. It's not that much fun, really. But um, here's here's what it is. Here's what it says. And so I had um, I had I was over on this side, and I went to go get water. And Brett said, "I'll get you your water." And so he went and got me my water. Then I remembered I had forgotten my message Bible, and so I had Larry go in and get my message Bible. And about the time Brett came back with my water, I said, I forgot my readers. Um, so Brett went out and got my readers, brought them back, and you guys are just going to have to put up with an old man for the next four years. It says this, though. Listen to what it says, and I love how it says it in the message. Are you hurting? Pray. Do you feel great? Sing. Are you sick? Call the church leaders together to pray and anoint you with oil in the name of the Master. 
Believing prayer will heal you and Jesus will put you on your feet. And if you sin, you'll be forgiven, healed inside and out. Make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other. Did you hear that? Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. The prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with. Elijah, for instance, human just like us, prayed hard that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't. Not a drop for three and a half years. Then he prayed that it would rain, and it did. The showers came and everything started growing again. My dear friends, if you know people who have wandered off from God's truth, don't write them off. Go after them. Get them back and you will have rescued precious lives from destruction and prevented an epidemic of wandering away from God. The word prayer... Uh, and we talk a lot about prayer, is mentioned seven times in this passage. As a matter of fact, James, they used to refer to him as camel knees because he was a man of prayer. The things, uh, it, but Jesus said in a prayer he, and, and in, to his disciples, he said this, the things that I do, you'll do even greater works. How do you do greater works than Christ himself? How do you do greater works than Jesus? Jesus said in the verse underneath that, it is by prayer. Anything you ask, you pray for. It's our greatest responsibility. It's our greatest thing that we can do. Um, when should I pray? First of all, I should pray when I'm hurting emotionally. When I'm hurting emotionally. Is there any one of you in trouble? He should pray. The word in Greek literally means... To suffer misfortune, to be under distress, under tension. In, in Timothy, it's translated hardships. He's talking about internal distress caused by external circumstances. Um, in Psalm 18.4, it says, In my distress I call unto the Lord. He's talking about this in light of what he, we have just covered again. He said in verse 12, Above all, my brothers, do not swear. In other words, when you're under tension, that when you're tempted to swear, when you have distress in your life, you have two alternatives. You either can swear or prayer. One of the two. Right underneath this, it says, is anyone happy? Let him sing the songs of praise. Have you noticed that life is a series of alternations between highs and lows and feast and famine? It says in the, in the Bible, it says, Weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. We had a um, circumstance this past week in which we wept with people who wept. We had on Friday, we had um, the, the, the funeral of Evelyn Shelton, as, uh, as jo Pastor Joey has already talked about. She was 96 years old. So it was, it was kind of one of those things where you wept on the one side because you're going to miss somebody that's always been with you. I mean, she's always been with this church and always, uh, always been a part. And, and so we, we, we weep on that side. But on, this, on the flip side of that, we don't weep. We, we rejoice because she's finally made it to her heavenly home. And that's exciting. And so we, we, we just say, glory to God and we'll see you one day. And it's not... It's not goodbye forever, it's that we'll see you again some, somewhere along the line. And then we went out to the, the Hattons, out to Butler, and, and uh, they had a grandbaby that um, had passed away from SIDS and three month old. And Oh my goodness, I want to tell you, it was, it was just, um, though the baby wasn't there, we didn't see the baby, the, um, we saw pictures and what a cute little baby it was, and just darling. And, and, and we, we had also then, we thought to ourselves, man, what a, what a horrible thing. And so we wept with those who wept. And, and um, so one of the job qualifications of a pastor is that you have to be willing to shift gears pretty quickly. 
Uh, a lot of people are up and a lot of people are down and when you're happy, live it to the hilt. And some people are afraid to do that they, because they feel that if they really enjoy God, if they really enjoy this life that God has given to them, then God is going to somehow zap them for enjoying life too much. And uh, so, um, so we come from that situation to today and and we, we, last week we met with two couples that are getting married in the church and they're, they're all bug-eyed and looking forward to, to, um, to getting married. And, and, uh, and, and so we're going through the, all this marriage counseling and, and they're excited and, and we rejoice with them and, and exciting. And, and uh, so especially Leah and Tyler, they're, they're, all, they're all giddy over the fact that they're getting married in May and and uh, they, they've got all of their ideals lined up about how marriage is going to go. And we, we don't want to discourage that, do we? we? We're not going to discourage that at all. So don't, don't, don't tell them that there are going to be any problems because they know it's all going to be good. Um, but I think that especially with a group of believers that come here on a Sunday morning. I don't believe that at any time that we should be downhearted, that we should be downcast, although we bring all of that junk into our, our congregation. We bring all of that here today. Kathy and I were talking um, just uh, in between the two funeral services, and, and we said, do you... Do you understand, I, I, I said to her, because she doesn't always understand this stuff, so I just thought I would remind her. I said, do you, do you, always, do you understand that on a, from Sunday to Sunday, do you realize the things that people go through on a regular basis and we just kind of bebop along and do our thing and, 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 we, and, and we don't even realize what somebody might have gone through this past week. There may have been somebody that's gone through a molestation, for example. There may be someone that has gone through a rape. There might have been somebody that's gone through some, um, some abuse at home. And there might have been somebody that's gone through some harsh words or criticism or, uh, or a marriage that is just on the brink of crumbling and falling apart. And There may be somebody, uh, a young child or even even a person at work that might have been bullied somewhere along the line. And, and they bring all of that into this situation right here in this place. And, um, and they bring everything in. And yet we say, you know what, this is not a funeral. This is not a time in which we, in which we grieve. This is a time in which we rejoice. Because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And since the time that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead, we worship on a Sunday to celebrate not his death, but his resurrection. And that we serve a resurrected living Lord. And, that, and that's what we celebrate. And so when we come, we really do come. And we say these words, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And folks, when we come together, we are, glad, we are a glad people because we have a good God who loves us and cares for us. So let me say again, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. It's an exciting time to get together with believers. Because believers know that this is not the end. Believers know that no matter what circumstances that we are in, that we have a God that is bigger than all of those circumstances that we can pray to and that we understand that. Um, so it's not a sad or bummed out time. So when we're happy, we sing. It's to be the lifestyle of the Christian. When I'm hurting physically, I ought to pray, secondly. Um, is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. And the word sick in Greek literally means without strength. You are totally wasted. You are fatigued. You are bedridden. 
you are unable to work. Now, somebody has said to me before that it's always the same people coming up for the same reason. And, well, it doesn't say that all you have to do is do it one time. If you are continually sick, then continually be anointed. That's how I feel about it. Saying it's okay, it's all right, that we can bring our, our burdens to the Lord constantly and consistently. Um, it's the same word used describing Lazarus. When Lazarus got sick, he died. There are approximately five different attitudes towards healing. And I want to be very specific here. And I want to also tell you that I'm not taking a shot at anybody. I wouldn't ever do that. First of all, there's the sensationalists. These are the guys that you may, you may see on TV. They come into town and hold giant meetings. Often the healer is flamboyant. Okay, I'm stopping there. He shouts at people. He slaps them on the head. He knocks them over. It is often a highly charged emotional atmosphere. And the guy might say, do you feel warm? And he's standing before 20,000 people rolling TV cameras and spotlights. Of course they feel warm. There, are, there is psychological motivation in all of this. And Jesus, I want to say this, Jesus never manipulated people and never used them for a show. He always carried, cared more about the needs of people than he did about the show that he was putting on. By the way, just because something is a miracle doesn't mean it's from God. You say, uh, how do you know that? Because I watched the Carbonaro effect once in a while, that's why. He claims no Christianity whatsoever. And of course, you remember when Moses laid down the stick and it became a serpent, what did the priest do? They did the exact same thing. And just because something that is done in the name of the Lord doesn't always mean that it's from God. Okay? Second thing, there's the confessionalists. The confessionalists say that it is always God's will for everybody to be healed. Sickness is a result of sin, personal sin. And all of you need to, all you need to do is claim your healing and God will heal you. The problem with that is, of course, there are multiple problems with that. And that is that some of those people that have claimed that are dead now. How did they die? The result of this is there is, no, there is an awful lot of guilt that is placed on an individual. Maybe I just didn't believe enough. Maybe I didn't have enough faith. But the Bible says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. What about the verse in 1 Peter that says, those who suffer according to the will of God. So in other words, you remember last week, I think it was, I talked about Job that suffered for 38 chapters in the book of Job. And then finally God healed him, touched him. What about him who, who went through all those things and it was, it was God that necessarily wasn't behind it, but he allowed those things to happen in Job's life. And Job, or God had an eternal perspective on Job's life saying he would not, he would not go against God. And he didn't, no matter how much he suffered. Now, the third thing is, is the dispensationalists. The dispensationalists are those who say the gifts of healing were only for the New Testament times and they no longer are around anymore. Don't bother looking for those gifts. It was great back in those days, but they're not here any longer. I have a problem with that view because in Hebrews it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I believe that he is, that he still heals, that he still does miraculous works, that he still is on the throne, and that he's on the throne room of people's lives. And he calls the shots, folks. He calls the shots. Then there are the rationalists. These are the people who say it's just all in your mind. If you're ill, it's because you think you're ill. Just deny it, and you'll be okay. Just deny it's happening, and it'll go away. The rationalists. I love those kinds of people. 
Then there's the realist. I think that James would have been a realist. This recognizes two facts. One, the fact that God still does heal. He does heal, but not everybody gets healed. That is also the fact of life. God does heal people today, but two, he doesn't heal everybody. I think life is an example of that. So what does James say to do when you are sick? You should call the elders of the church. 1 Peter 5 says in Acts 20, and Titus 2 tells us the structure of the church. James says you call the spiritual leaders of your church to pray for you. These guys are not hired guns. They are not professional healers who go around holding healing meetings. An example of that in Scripture is Jesus. If anybody had the right to hold mass meetings, he could have had it in the New Testament. Healing oftentimes was a private matter. I find it strange that people who claim to have the gift of healing always insist that sick people come to them rather than them going to the sick. And it says, he should call the elders. Who's doing the calling? The sick person? This implies support for belongings to a local body of Christ. We could stop there for a while, and maybe we will. I want to be very clear on this. Every Christian needs to identify himself with a particular body of believers. Why? One good reason is that when, when you get sick, you know who to call on. In the New Testament, there was no such thing as free-floating Christians, free agents, you know what I'm talking about, who would just go floating around, listen to Christian radio and TV, and bounce around from church to church. There was no such thing in the New Testament. Every person was a member of a specific local body. Now, they might not have got them up in a formal service like we do and say, you got you got to do this and this and this and this. That, that might not have been. But they were a part of a local body of Christ. I cannot be strong enough on this position right here that all of us need to be a part of a local body of Christ. Why? So you can pay the pastor, that's why. Oh, no. All of us need to be a part of a local body of Christ. After a while, somebody will say, you know what? I wasn't there for two weeks, three weeks, and nobody missed me. Well, I wonder why. Maybe because in the past you have established yourself as kind of spotty in the past. Amen? And so if we are... If we are sick, or if we just decide, well, you know what, I'm going to lay in bed and, um, and just take it easy for a week and not do much of anything. Um, let me tell you something. When somebody is consistent in their walk with Jesus Christ, they will be consistent on a local level. Amen? He is... He is, now, this guy, the guy that is probably in bed, so they are praying over him. He is seriously ill and anoint him with oil. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, like many symbols in Scripture. When we baptize with water, water is a symbol of the burial of Christ. It is an excellent time, especially at Easter time. It is symbolic in the sense that it is just like Jesus Christ was raised from death to life. That we have been raised from death in our trespasses and sin. But we have been raised to new life. And we live by the Spirit of God. Water is a symbol of the burial. When we take communion. The juice is a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ. And all through Scripture we are told that there is, if we claim the blood of Jesus Christ, certain things do happen. And when we take communion that it is more than just symbolic, I believe, that, but when we take com communion, that God is with us in a very, very special way. There is one group of believers that believe that it actually becomes the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We don't believe that. But I do believe that there are certain times 
when God is with us in an extremely close way, and communion is one of those times. And it's not just, oh, dip, a, dip a little bread in the juice and eat it up and you're good to go. No, no. It's more than that, you guys. If Jesus said, don't do this, un if, if the Bible said, don't do it unworthily, in other words, if you're not a believer, if you're not part of the family of God, don't do it. Because if you do, you drink damnation and eat damnation to your soul. That's pretty serious stuff. I remember when I was a little boy, they used to really, really stress that. And I remember there were times where I might have beat up Jerry Cox down the street or done something like that. And they would, then they would take, want us to take communion. And I would think, man, if I do this, God's going to really get me. But he never really did. And, but it scared me to death. But there are certain times, you guys, that yes, it's fun to come to church, and yes, it's a celebration, and all of those things. Yes, we celebrate the, the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you something. We should never, ever, ever take away the holy existence of God within our, within our times together. You see, the Bible says where two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst of us. In other words, there's more than two or three that gathered here today. And so within the power of the air, within the power of, of what is in here today, within us is, is Jesus Christ Himself. And God is moving in our midst. No matter what we're doing, God is here because we have gathered in the name of Jesus Christ and in the form of His Spirit, He is here and we acknowledge Him and He is holy and we, we acknowledge Him. If we knew for sure, if we knew for sure, let me ask you this, if we knew for certain, there was no doubt about it, that Jesus Christ was to walk in one of those back doors or one of these side doors right now. And we knew that it was Jesus. I mean, we knew. There was no doubt about it. What would your reaction be? I don't know about you, but I think I would get and I would fall on my face before Him. Because I would recognize His holiness and my sinfulness. I would recognize His divinity and my humanity. There are times when we need to be struck, awestruck by the very presence of an almighty God. And I ask you, just like I've asked before, when was the last time we came into service and we went, whoa, there is something bigger than us in this whole thing. And that is that God is with us and God is in our midst and God is moving and God is on the scene and God is here. There's something bigger, you guys, than just us meeting on a Sunday morning at 1030. It is bigger than that, singing a few songs. It is bigger than preaching a few words. It is bigger than that. And that is that the Spirit of God dwells in the people of God and the people of God bring Him here. And when the people of God get together, there is a awesomeness of the holy. It's unbelievable. You walk out, somebody says, how's oh, church? Oh, it's all right. What do you mean it was all right? Well, you know, we sing a few songs. Jimmy rattled on about how we need to be more excited about coming to church. And the pastor did the same thing. He just followed it up, what Jimmy said. And he copies Jimmy all the time. And so... Whoa. He's not sitting right next to you, you guys. He's not sitting in your lap. He's not sitting two rows over on the right-hand side or three rows over on the left-hand side. 
He's not sitting in the coffee shop. He's not sitting anywhere. He is sitting inside of you. He lives inside of you. He is here. And we recognize the presence of an almighty God. He is here. He is here. And we recognize that. Hallelujah. He is here. We thank you, Father. For sending your son Jesus Christ. But then, before you left, I, he said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. But I'm going to send another, another meaning just like himself. That will live with you forever. I go to prepare a place for you. I will sit at the right hand of my father making intercession for you. But there is one coming after me. He does not draw attention to himself, but points everything to me. He will be in you. Oh, Jesus. That blows me away, Jesus. That, that just astounds me. That every word that I say, that every, everything that I do, every gesture that I make, every attitude that I have, should be like him because he lives on the inside of me. And I want to be like him. Boy, do I want to be like him. Lord, help me with the next part of this service because I don't know where I'm going. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, we're talking about prayer. So I thought I'd throw in a little prayer because I didn't know where I was at. The prayer offered in sick or in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. We do this in our church, but it is a low-key ministry. We don't practice have healing campaigns or big emotional service or knock anybody down. When the Bible says, when I'm hurting emotionally, I ought to pray. When I'm hurting physically, when I've got major illness, I call for the spiritual leaders of the church to pray. Third thing, when I'm hurting spiritually is when I pray. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. I've heard something like this. Man, if I walked in the church, you don't realize what I've done in my life. The church, the church would probably fall down. Well, it'd probably fall down because we're so excited about the fact that we're hanging from the rafters that you came. Listen, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. Friends, I want to tell you, there is no, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. In other words, there is no longer condemnation. And so I can look at you and say, hey, look, I screwed up, but Jesus Christ has made a difference in my life, and I messed up, but I want to tell you that Jesus Christ can make a difference in my life, and He can make a difference in your life. He can, he can make a big, big difference. In Jesus' day, in many places today, it's taught that all sickness is a result of sin. If you're ill, then supposedly you had some hidden sin in your life. If you confessed and still were sick and you still had some other hidden sin, Jesus blew that out of, idea out of the water in John chapter 9 where he said to the man who had been born blind that nobody had sinned, either him or his parents. I think that's a very unfair concept. You think of babies being born with birth defects. Obviously that baby hasn't sinned. We live in a fallen world and part of the problem is, is that there are hurts and problems in our world. On the other hand, Jesus did teach a, that a lot of sickness we do bring on, brings on and that we bring it on in our own lives. I know individuals who have chewed. Some of you might do that. But do you realize that if you do that, that you might get cancer? I'm just saying, I'm just throwing it out there, you guys, that's all. That might happen. So, 
don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. And I worry and fret and get anxious and get an ulcer. Then I'm to blame for, uh, then I am the one to blame for it. If I allow resentment to build up in my life, do you know how many people are ruining their lives and they're making themselves old just because they have resentment in their lives towards somebody that did something to them 50 years ago or 20 years ago or 10 years ago? Do you know how, do you know how angry some people are? My wife, yesterday we were going somewhere and I put, I, she's told me not to do it a hundred times, but I told her she never has told me that. But I put my phone up in her car in a certain spot and when she pulls the shift up like that, she hits her, she hits her hand. And I said, thinking of this message, of course, I, she went and did that and she she said, dog, that hurts. I wish you wouldn't put your thing there. I said, do you have some anger problem that you have in your life that you want to you wanna go ahead and confess? Well, that made it really a lot better. It really helped us in our marriage that I just wa- let her get that out of her. She got something out of her, all right. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. Why isn't everybody healed? I don't know. That's a great answer from a pastor, isn't it? Why isn't everybody healed? I don't know. I remember many, many years ago, I was asked to do a funeral for a baby. It was Larry McClanahan's little guy. And, and uh, he asked me to do a funeral for that. And I remember I said, God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Give me some good words as to why this baby died. Why did this baby die? And so I went into the pulpit and I just simply said, I don't know why this happens. I do know this though. The Hattons, for example, I do know this. I want to tell you this. Heaven would be a mighty boring place if all it was was people that were older and had glorified bodies. Because even if they're glorified bodies, they're still older. And so if there were no children in heaven, it would be a boring, boring place to be. Because all we would do is sit around on a cloud playing harp and considering the lint in our navel if it was just for older people. But children, children live in a place up. If you don't believe it, you ought to go to the children's section over here sometimes. You'll get livened up real quick. It's a liberating experience to confess your sins and get them out and to share them with each other. Confess to each other. Does that mean I get up and confess to the whole church? There is a principle of the circle of confession. Only confess as widely as it involves other people. If I've got private sin just between me and the Lord, then I ought to just confess it to the Lord. If it's a personal sin between me and you, then I come to you. If it's a public sin, then I need to apologize to the whole church. We believe that, right? I told you this story before. My sister, she used to run the nursery of the church. Well, of course, that's just a really popular thing, you know, because, because parents are never fussy about their children. I mean, do they just stick them in the nursery and forget about them, and then they come back, and everything's fine, and everything's good, even if your kid fell down and got a boo-boo on them, like, like, like you would have prevented that. But anyway, so my my sister was in the middle of a service one day and in in a church of a thousand people. And this gal gets up and she says, I've carried something against Rosie Evans for three or four years now. Rosie knew, not my sister Rosie, knew nothing of it. She came out of there thinking, man, in front of a thousand people. And it was just, it was absolutely, you you could have heard a pen drop. Who was the issue between? The issue was between that lady and my sister 
not that lady and the entire church. So don't go all self-righteous and get up in the middle of a service and go, I've held something against Pastor Joey for a long time. Because all that does is make you look like, hey, I'm coming clean here. Unless you've mouthed off to the entire church about Pastor Joey, then you get up in front of the entire church. So does anybody want to... <laughs> When should I pray? James tells us we can pray whenever you've got a need, a physical need, an emotional pray, need, a material need, no matter what it, you ought to pray. Who can pray? James uses Elijah as an illustration. Eliza was, Elijah was a man just like us. Just like us. Elijah was a man just like us. We often think of all of those prophets of old, especially when they have names like Elijah, Elisha, um, Nehemiah, um, names like that, those were really holy people. But he says Elijah was a man just like us, just like you and I. Had the same problems, circumstances, situations, just like you and I. As a matter of fact, he dealt with depression, just like us. He prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain in the land for three and a half years. He prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Remember, Elijah was a man just like us. The lesson of Elijah's life is you don't have to be perfect to pray. It's for ordinary people. First Kings Elijah got alone with God and humbled himself praying for rain. It says he prayed seven times. He was persistent in his praying. He wouldn't give up. And one day a little cloud formed in the sky. And he said, it's going to be a gusher. And the rains came and flooded the entire place. How can I pray effectively? I want to review a few conditions. First of all, for praying, I must ask. I must ask. Now, this is, this is rocket science, you guys. That sounds simple, but a lot of our prayers, we never ask for anything. We say thank you and bless this and bless that. But we never pray specifically for anything. But James says you do not have because you do not ask. Be specific, Third, set, next thing, have the right motive. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend and get on your, it on your own pleasures. If you're going to ask in prayer, make sure your motives are right, not for selfishness, but for a genuine reason, and that is the glory of God. Next thing, live a clean life. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. If you're a Christian and you are righteous, we're not talking about perfection. We're talking about righteousness. Righteousness is right living. Righteousness is your standing before God when you became a believer in Him. Psalm 66, 18, David said, If I hide, regard, conceal, iniquity, sin in my heart, then the Lord will not hear. If I am willfully and knowingly doing something I know is displeasing to God and say, God, I'm going to continue doing it, this, but by the way, help me out. Last thing, ask in faith. James 1, 6. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. When you come to God, that he wants to answer your prayers, trust him, don't doubt, really believe. Really believe. How important is your prayer life to you? I want to confess to you, I struggle with this more than any other area of your, my life. This area, I, I, I tell you, I've got ADD. I'm serious. I, I, have, I have grown up 58-year-old ADD, which is worse than 11 or 10 or 9-year-old ADD. I guarantee you. Your mind is on one thing at one minute, another thing at another. This area of being consistent in prayer, I talk to the Lord all the time, but I really don't have the prayer life I want to have I want to know Him in a deeper way. I want our church to be a miracle of God. I want to... I like this when I put this down. I want our church to be an embarrassment to the devil. I want our church to be an embarrassment to the devil. When the devil looks around and says, see how I'm working in that church, I've got them all divided. 
Isn't that funny how I've got them all divided? See how I'm working in that church? I've got them all negative against something. See how I'm working in that church? I've got, I've got half the members against the pastor and half of them for the pastor. See how I'm working? But I want him to look at our church and be embarrassed about our church. Amen. And him say, doggone it. I should do five push-ups. <laughs> doggone it. There is, a, there is a church that is unified as a body of Christ. They love each other. They care about each other. They're doing exactly as God wants them to do. Are there sinners? Yes, because the church should have sinners in it, right? But they're doing everything they know how to do. They are trying to be faithful with what they have. And they're an embarrassment to me. I mean, after all, I can work in almost anywhere, but man, I don't want to touch that grace point there. No way. No way. 